uh, start today or whenever it starts. All right. Everybody found it? Genesis chapter 15. Let's begin reading at verse number 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house, uh, Eliezer of Damascus, is he the one? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir. Your slave is not going to be your heir. But he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought forth abroad, and he said, Look now toward heaven and toward the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted unto him it for righteousness. He believed the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. Verse number five says, Come forth abroad. In another translation, it says, Come out of your tent and look toward the stars. Come out of your tent and look toward the stars. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in this church with this family. We pray, God, for an anointing that you would stir us, direct us. Give us clear vision, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to challenge us as I preach this message, living in the tent. Living in the tent. I want to challenge us to examine our vision. Too often we get stuck in trying to recapture, remember, or recalibrate our vision that we've received regarding our lives or regarding our ministries. Remember what it says in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, a vision is more than clear eyesight, but rather, according to the strong concordance, it's a prophetic vision. It's a dream, an oracle, a revelation that comes from God with divine insight. So Proverbs is saying, when a society does not have a revelation from God, it's heading into the direction of a state of order. In our lives, we've got to understand our vision brings order. Our vision brings stability. It gives a blueprint for how I'm to live my life. It is a blueprint of direction into my life. Pastor Larry Stocksell explains that a vision is like car headlights. You're either on low beam or you're on high beam. If you're driving on low beam, you're afraid to move past your vision, so you slow down. But when you put your lights on high beam, you see a lot more. Your vision is expanded, so you feel free enough to move a little faster. So more vision, Stockstill says, equals more motion. More vision equals more motion. It's just the way it works. Your vision activates your faith. It becomes the blueprint of your future. I want to question you this morning. How is your vision? Do you have one for your life, for your family? Do you remember the vision that God gave you years ago? Are you living in your vision? You see, in our text, Abram, not yet Abraham, Abram has been faithful to God. In Genesis chapter 12, he received instructions to God to leave the comfortable place of his father to set out in the search of a promise. He's told, I'm going to make you a great nation. This is chapter 12. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You will be a blessing. The Lord given him instructions. Abram followed. Abram obeyed and left and began on this journey. And at this point, the promise had to be renewed in chapter 13, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 14 and 18. God renewed the covenant promise. Up to this point now, he's, Abram's traveled through several lands. He's built altars. He's offered sacrifices to the Lord. He rescued Lot. Abram's had an encounter with Melchizedek, the most, priest of the Most High God, who pronounced a blessing over Abram. And then Abram, in turn, gave him a tithe, a tenth of all that he had. So at this point, Abram looks like he's doing pretty good. He's searching. He's obeying. He's received a word. He's received a divine blessing from the priest of the Most High God. 
He's giving unto the Lord. Life is good. But in chapter 15, Abram is sitting in his tent. For the, for the sake of it, maybe he's meditating on all the things of the past. Maybe he's in prayer. Maybe he's singing, how great is our God. I don't know what he was doing, but all of a sudden, in the middle of that tent, he has a vision. And the Lord says to Abram, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. I am your exceeding great reward. Abram's a little confused. He's already been told that he's going to be made into a great nation. He's already been renewed of the covenant in chapter 13. So this is not the first time or the second time that the Lord has reminded him, God has reminded him of his purpose, of his vision. But he's still a little confused. God, is my slave going to be the heir? I know that he's a trusted man. I know that I haven't been in charge of everything. I don't have a child, so I'm assuming this servant of mine is who you've given me. And listen, Abram isn't mad at God at this point. He's not frustrated, I don't believe. He simply doesn't understand. And he's asking God if this servant is going to be his heir. So listen, in your life, if you want to write this down, when you lack vision, it's easy to begin to downplay the promise in your life. When you don't have a clear understanding of your vision, when you don't have a clear understanding of who you are in your walk with Christ and what God has called you to be, you'll begin to downplay and compromise the promise that God has for your life. You'll begin to offer God other options. You'll give God other plans to fulfill your vision because you can't figure out how it's going to work. Amen. I don't believe Abraham's questioning God uh, because he doesn't have faith. I think he lacks knowledge. We know Abram's the father. Abraham is the father of faith, but he is a man of faith. He was in a very uh, prodigalized land, and God called him out of the land of all the prodigals and moved him into uh, a place that Abram could be alone and hear from God better. That's another message. But here's the thing. I think he just simply lacked knowledge. You see, God will often give you a promise or a vision that you cannot work out with the math equation. He'll often give you a plan that doesn't match up with your current situation. You may have faith, and you may have all the faith to step out and walk on water, but if you don't have the spiritual foresight to see how it's going to happen, you'll step back and go, God, I don't know what's going on here. Lord, I need you to help me. The Spirit of the Lord continues to tell Abram, the one that comes from your seed is going to be your heir. This man, slave of yours, is not your promise. Abraham's stuck in his tent, sitting in his teepee. It was not a teepee, but it just flows well from the tongue. Sitting in his teepee, Abram is sitting there, contemplating, downplaying, trying to figure out how this awesome vision is going to come from a woman who can't have a, a, a baby and a man that can't produce one. So the Spirit says, Abram, go outside of your tent. Look up toward the heavens and count the stars. And if you're able to number them, that's how many descendants you will have. Abram was limited in his vision because he was in his tent. Before he could see a greater vision, before he could begin to understand the concept of the greatness of his life in the power of God, he had to step outside of his tent. Some of us are guilty of living in the tent. We are chasing our dreams and we're chasing our promises. And we're doing everything we can to be obedient. But in our tent, we can't, try to, we can't even figure out what God is talking about. Because God, there's more to God than the limitations of our tent. Our, our tent, our, our, the, the, the ceiling of our teepee is just not high enough to understand what God's trying to do in your life. So you live in the tent, chasing your dream. But see, here's what happens in your proverbial tent. The reality of your life is all about limitations. All you see is, I'm limited. In your tent, you see your inabilities, all the things you're weak at. You don't see any strengths in the tent. Lord, I ain't got time to chase all kind of rabbits because I started this message early. And I must remember by starting early, it doesn't mean I get out at the same time. So I want you to get this. In the tent, Abram says, my wife is barren and my seed is dead. 
In your tent, you never focus on, I got a God that can bring alive a dead body. I got a life that can awaken seed in me and egg in Sarah. I've got a God, because you're limited by your ceilings. In the tent, all we see is our shortcomings. In the tent, we're reminded of all of our mistakes, all of our past sins and our past failures. In the tent, we often try to figure out a way to make it work. I want to encourage you today to step outside of your tent and see the fullness of the God you serve. Step outside of, side of that uh, tent and see the full vision of God. You're being limited by your surroundings. Get out of your tent and look up to a God who is able to do the impossible in your life. God wants to send you a snapshot, just a click, click, click snapshot. Well, I don't know which one of those uh, social media things. Is it Snapchat? You only get a few seconds, and once you click on it, you see the picture, and it vis disappears, which is why it's very scary for our kids to have that, because somebody can send them naked pics, and they can view it in seven seconds, and then it's out of their ability to pull it back up. Pretty wise of the devil to give something like that to kids, isn't it? That's another sermon. I'm focusing on the vision. Not that vision. We, won't want, we don't want that seven-second vision. <laughs> So what happens, God wants to give you a snapshot. He wants to give you a, what's the name of that thing? I just said it. Snapchat, Snapchat picture of your vision. He wants to give you a, a flea. Woo! How's that going to happen? He does that to keep you motivated to keep seeking him. He does that to keep you trying to stay in his presence so you can get to what that little vision. He may not show you every step, every turn, every valley, every hill. You just saw the promise of a seven second ending of how God wants to do in your life. But well, what you have to do is you got to live in faith and live in his presence to figure out how to get to what he's given you. So he gives you that, that, that vision of what he wants to fulfill in your life so that you'll keep trusting him. He wants to give you that snapshot so you'll keep obeying him. He wants you to have a vision that will strengthen your faith because faith begins with a vision. You can't, if you don't have a vision of what God wants to do in your life, you don't need faith. If you're just going to live in the way the world wants you to live, you don't need faith. I don't have to have faith to get up out of my bed and go to water flowers at Wilson's. I barely got to breathe to do that, to be honest. Wish I didn't have to do that. Love you, Wayne, because he watches. Do you understand the church has learned to live without faith? And I believe it's because we don't have a vision of a God that can heal the sick and raise the dead. A God that still casts out devils. A God that can grow crooked arms back out straight. Don't lose the vision of a God that is able... If your vision is not stretching your faith, maybe it's too small because you're in the tent. Because in my tent, oh, I can fulfill this TP. In my tent, oh yeah, all oh, God can show up in this little place. But when you step outside the tent and see the multitude of the starry skies and God says, this is an example. This is what your descendants will be like. This is the power I will release in your life. Then it takes a little more faith. Stocksell says, you must see what God sees in the spirit world. Then your faith will rise above your circumstances. See what God sees in the spirit world. Get into a place where God will reveal to you. The secrets through the word. Get in a place where God will call you outside of your comfortable surroundings into an uncomfortable place and try to tell a dead, barren womb you're about to give birth to the multitude of the nations. Oh, my goodness. Get outside of your tent and let God show you that a little church and rising fund can reach the masses of people. We don't know how, but we know we serve a God that can. Let God get in the spirit realm where God can show you something other than the natural so that you can move into what God is trying to get you into and then all of a sudden you realize God is bigger than your circumstances and you begin to cross over the circumstances because you're not looking at your TP you're looking at the God you serve 
Don't live with a tent mentality. Don't live with a tent mentality, limiting, limiting yourself to an all-natural confined vision. You see, with a tent mentality, you believe life is meant to always be a struggle to survive. In a tent mentality, you believe it's just your purpose in life to never have, to never be full of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I, I guess I'll know. It just ain't meant to me to have the Holy Ghost. I don't have to have the Holy Ghost to go to heaven. No, you don't, but it's a gift. Why not say, God, I, I don't have to live saying I can't get him and I don't deserve him. Now get into God, step outside of your tent, and let him fill you with the power of the Holy Ghost. And not just the power, but the fire of the Holy Ghost. Not only do you speak in tongues, but you lay hands on the sick and they recover. You cast out devil. You tread on serpents and you drink in the deadly thing and it shall not harm you because you got a vision bigger than yourself. You got a vision that's bigger than yourself. Switch the lights to high beam and get a bigger vision. Step out of the tent mentality spiritually. Look up and see a God that still does. When you move outside the tent, God's vision for our future will activate your faith. His vision for my life becomes the blueprint of my future. Look to God and let, me, let him give you something greater than your reality. Listen, we don't have to live in the reality. Oh, I know. Monday, thank God, it's Labor Day and it's Sleep Late Day. And I'm going to sleep until the dog barks at a neighbor walking down the street. Hope it's raining in the mornings. So my neighbors stay in their house. We don't need no walkers on Country Club Lane tomorrow. Listen. In the reality of my life, I know I'm going to get up Tuesday morning and go to work. I know I'm going to get up Tuesday morning and pull a weed, sell a, a day bed or whatever. But here's the thing. I also can live in a reality much better than reality. I'll say that again. I can live in a reality much better than reality because I'm not just man. I'm man and spirit because I have something inside of me that can grasp onto things that other men cannot see. I can live in joy in the middle of a trial. I can live standing next to Jesus in the middle of a pit. I can live in, a, in, in the middle of a lion's den with peace and comfort and lay my head on their belly and sleep. I can lay down in the middle of a whale's belly knowing that I'm going to come up out of this grave one day because there's something more to me than just reality. Amen. I'll let God give you a road map and a compass. Maybe you're not, you're not there. Maybe it's been a long time. Maybe it's not today that we're going to see it come to pass. Maybe it's years away. Are you being led by the hand of God putting you into the future of your life? Listen, God wants to paint your picture stroke by stroke. He showed you uh, what it's going to look like. But now he wants to paint it stroke by stroke, line by line, precept by precept, from glory to glory. It's a picture in your spirit, but, but it develops as you take steps of faith. It's like those watercolor boards. Y'all know when, when you liked them as parents because they didn't get junk all over your house. You, you, you'd put a little water on this white board and all of a sudden the foot becomes pink. Before long, everything is pink. But, you know, it's, you just put a little color, just a little water on a Q-tip, and you let your kids, our kids used to play with them in church when Chloe and Sadie were little because it was, they were, it was quiet and, oh, they just dip in there. Oh, listen, that's what life is. When I live by faith, all of a sudden, what is invisible becomes visible, not because of me, but because I'm trusting in the God who's given me the picture. You take a step, and you begin to see a little bit more. You make a mistake. You begin to see the picture looks a little distorted, but you're still developing. Because sometimes in life, you've got to have mistakes to make it to the next place. I'll say that again. Sometimes in life, you've got to have a mistake to make it to the next place. Your life is not going to be perfect, so get over it. Sometimes it's going to be outside the line. Sometimes it's going to be too heavy of a line. But you remember old Bob Doss, Goss, what, what, what was the man? Ross, Bob Ross. Sister Sandra used to be Bob Ross, the female version. Y'all know she's a painter? Y'all, she used to handle snakes in church. She's a singer, a guitar player, and a painter. By, I mean, she, she's an artist. And you know, I used to get so mad watching Bob Ross. Cooper, you need to look him up on the internet. Because he'd have a beautiful picture, and he'll say, let's just put a little tree right here. And he'd draw a big old black line right down the middle of the canvas. 
a happy little tree. And you're like, Bob, you've destroyed that picture with a big old tree, right? But, but when he got finished, oh, the tree was somewhere in all the background. You couldn't even tell that that tree started with a big old look like mistake. And you know what little old Bob Ross would say? He wasn't worried about a mistake. He just turned it into something pretty and happy. I mean, he just made it all all right. In your life, you're going to go through some stuff. God will turn it all right. It's going to make, in your life, things are not going to go the way you want. But in my life, all things work together for the good of the, to me. It works to my good. Maybe the vision gave me a quick view of the end. But now I have to figure out all the intricate paths. Remember, it was 25 years roughly when Abraham was told about having Isaac. 25 years is a long time. Some of us have a hard time waiting 25 days, don't we? You add 25 months, that's, ooh, that's a lifetime. 25 years to see the fulfillment of a vision. How many of us have given up on year 23 because we just got sick of waiting? Life is a journey and it takes longer than you realize to be fulfilled. That's why you just keep that mental image of what God gave you. I know this is family worship, so I'm about to give. I'm going to be as PG as I can. I don't know about you ladies, but for us men, do you know a vision will last a lifetime? An image. An image. I'll let you, I'm going to let that settle in your spirit for a second. An image that I saw as a 13-year-old boy. I can pull it up today and it looks just like I saw it today. Y'all know what kind of image I'm talking about? All right. Because in the man's mind, that image, and that's why pornography is so dangerous, because it burns into your mind, and then you don't even have to watch it. You just remember it. Amen. I'm chasing a rabbit here, but I'm going to chase it. Because the way the man's mind is, I don't even have to look at it today. I can go back before, I can go back in my 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds with my little friend Curtis down the street, and I can see the images that were still there in those magazines. Uh-oh, y'all are so quiet. So if that is the case, then why can't we use what the devil is using for bad and use it for good? Why can't I get that vision from the Lord, pull that thing up and say, God, 10 years ago, this is the vision you gave me about ministry. This is the vision. I don't know how it's working out, but I can remember it. I can still taste it like it was yesterday. I can still see it as if it's as fresh as right now. So God, I see it even though you gave it to me 10 years ago. But sometimes we get back into TP. Even great men of faith like Abram will settle for a head maiden named Hagar. And will produce a son named Ishmael to try to keep God's plan. Where did Abram go to produce Ishmael? Back to the tent. In order for him to settle on the vision, in order for his wife to talk him into sleeping with her maid to be able to produce an heir, he had to go back to the place where God said, get out of this tent. But when you move back into your tent, you'll begin to compromise what God is telling you is not for you. Uh, oh, this is deeper than I had anticipated. Because I want you to understand, when you move back in the tent, you no longer see the stars. You begin to see the handmaid. You begin to see Hagar. You begin to sleep with things you ain't got no business sleeping with. God told you it would be, listen, you need to realize the power of the original vision. Don't try to destroy what God wants to do in your life. Get out of the tent. Look up and see the tent of your, and the stars we're all guilty, though. Let's not, let's not throw no stones up in here and y'all quit tossing tomatoes at me. We're all guilty of isolating ourselves, aren't we? We get discouraged. We get impatient. We get aggravated. We get frustrated. We get hurt. And as a result, we go back to the tent and we forget about the majestic starry night sky. And we move right back. Oh, I've waited forever, Pastor Chris. 
I've waited and I've waited. So there's something wrong with me or something wrong with God. It must not have been the vision anyway. I must have just, that must have been my own imagination. That must, because it was so out there and so big, there's no way that was for me anyway. And then we get in the tent and we sit there and we fight depression and we fight discouragement. And listen to this word. And we fight defeatism. I don't know if that's a real word, but it's the word the Spirit gave me. We fight defeatism. Because we feel defeated in every area of our lives. I'll just speak from my own experiences. When I've been in a, in a bad place, I'll think somebody that don't even know anything about my spirit is against me. And I'm like, why, why do I feel like this person's mad at me? They don't even know me. What has this person heard in the, in, in the streets? Why they treat me? They ain't treat me no way. I'm fighting the spirit of defeatism. Oh, that's, a, that's another story for another day. So what do we do? We isolate ourselves back into the tent. I want to give you some four things real quick as I check the clock. I have six minutes. May go over. Chris Sonskin in a book titled Saving Your Church from Itself. Great book for leaders of our church to read. Saving Your Church from Itself gives four dangers of isolation. Let me give these to you. Number one. When you isolate yourself back in the tent, it opens the doors to distorted perceptions and negative assumptions. Because there's nobody there to say, come on, man. There's nobody there to say, come on, you're thinking wrong. Come on, that, that's the wrong assumption. Quit being negative. There's nobody there to hold you accountable. There's nobody to say, look up and see the stars. Number two, it exaggerates our feelings and it turns them into false facts. When you begin to isolate yourself in a tent, it exaggerates our feelings and it turns them into false facts. Ain't everybody in this church ain't against you. Ain't nobody really talking about you. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody running. Ain't, it ain't happening. We have to tell our kids there's a lot more things in the world than you. If you think they're looking at you and talking about you, you're probably wrong because you ain't the only one in the room. They got a lot more stuff to worry about than you. I know we're a, little, we're a little more real at my house than y'all are. But it exaggerates their feelings and it turns them into false facts. Number three, it gives the enemy an opportunity to build on the anger we feel. When I get there and I isolate myself, oh, there's a seed of anger there. And before long, it's not only a seed, it's a tree bearing bitter fruit. And I will, think, I will begin to lash out at everybody around me. Oh, Sarah better, better get out the way. Hagar better get out the way. And Ishmael better get out the way because I'm mad at everybody. I don't know why I'm mad. I don't know why I'm against everybody. But I've sat in this isolation long enough and somebody's going to get me today. Because the enemy just builds that anger. Number four, it fosters the pain and turns us into a victim. It fosters the pain and turns us into a victim. If you're not careful, we'll move back into the tent, isolate ourselves from God and the people of God, and we begin to forget the vision, we forget the covenant, and we develop a false mindset that we're the victims of not being loved. I'm a victim of not being needed. I'm a victim of not being wanted. I'm a victim unworthy. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. And we think we never have purpose or meaning. And we believe a lie inside the tent. And we never look up. Get your eyes off your ceiling. Quit living in the tent. Move to a place where God will order your steps. He has purpose for you. He's got meaning for your life. He has more than you could imagine for you to accomplish, but you got to leave the tent. I know it's comfortable and cozy, but leave the tent. God wants to give you a vision for your life. He wants to give you a revelation of his plans for you. Yes, they're higher than you can imagine, but you'll never receive them sitting in the tent. Are you afraid? Abram was. And God says, Abram, don't be afraid. I am your shield. I am your great reward. And I believe God is declaring that over you today. I know you're in a new territory. I know you're in an unfamiliar place. And it doesn't make sense where you are. 
Keep your eyes and your faith on God. Don't be afraid. I believe God is saying, I will be your shield and I will be your protection. I will go before you. I am still the reward of the faithful. Getting ready to close. God has not decided to leave his children in the year 2022. God has not decided to give up on us. He hasn't decided to put us in the tent and crash it down upon us. (laughs) He still wants to be our shield. He still wants to be our reward. He still wants to lead his children out of the tent and into fulfillment. I know the world is falling apart, but God is not. Don't be afraid to leave the tent. Don't be afraid of the circumstances of life. The wolves that surround you, just step on outside. God's going to protect you. Don't be afraid. Let me remind you today of the greatness and the goodness of God. So let me begin to close. Sadie, you can begin the music. That way I'll know I have to stop. Have you received a vision for your life spiritually? Have you been into a place to where God has given you a snapshot of your purpose in Him? Has God given you a revelation? If He has, I want you to bring that back to the front. If your vision is bigger than you, awesome. That means you got to have more faith. And your vision is going to stretch your faith. God wants to give you a vision in order to activate your faith. He wants to give you something bigger than yourself so that you got to trust in Him. Listen, let me tell you this. You'll never accomplish what God has for you on your own. It's impossible. Oh, yeah, you may have a bunch of Ishmaels, but you're never going to have the Isaac until you leave the tent and trust in a God that is bigger than yourself. You've got to begin the journey, but it starts with faith. Why don't you ask God today, show me the stars. Show me my purpose. Give me a revelation. Can I challenge you to be brave? Step outside of the tent and look up. Maybe you've been stuck for a long time. I can look back in my life, Sister Tony, and I think about things the Lord told me in 1988 at the foot of an old rugged cross that we were using to nail prayer requests on. And I was slain in the spirit at the foot of the cross and God gave me a vision of ministry. Haven't seen it come to pass yet. And every now and then that, that, that conversation God had for me as an 18 year old will pop right back up into my mind as if I just heard it all over again. If you've been stuck and you've lived in the tent, Oh, listen, I've gone back in the tent more than I want to tell you. I'm going to be brave enough to step back out and say, God, I know you've got more. I've seen it. I wonder if you'll ask God today to give you a a, a reminder of the clear vision and the purpose he has for you. And maybe you've been in the tent with Hagar and God is saying, that's not your promise. Quit claiming Ishmael as your promise. Now, here's the hard thing, and I'm, I'm on another topic now. God required Abram, Abraham, to kiss Ishmael goodbye and to send him on his way. And he told him, quit worrying about that. Abraham loved Ishmael. It was his firstborn, don't forget. It was born out of covenant, but it was still his firstborn, and he loved him. But he required him to give him a kiss and to send him on his way. Sometimes God requires us to send our uncoveted promise on the way. Lord, that is deep right there. Sometimes God will require you to send your uncoveted promise on the way. Something you created in the tent that was never supposed to be yours. He may tell you to kiss it goodbye. Are you strong enough to do that? Are you willing to say, God, I will send Ishmael on the way because there's a power. But listen how, ain't God faithful. God says, Abraham, don't worry. Hey, Hagar, quit crying. Your son too will will watch this. Lord, I'm deep now, and and I'm supposed to be stopping the music's playing, Scott and Jane. They got to get all the way back into Chattanooga before the traffic gets bad. Listen, probably too late for that, y'all. Probably too late. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. The power of what God gave Abram in his seed created a nation in an uncovenanted promise. 
because Abraham's seed was so powerful that even in Hagar, it produced many nations. The commitment to Abraham's seed that even the unwanted child prospered and multiplied like the stars. That's why it's important you don't drop seed in the wrong place. I'm a little too deep. It's important that you don't drop seed of power in the wrong place. You'll multiply a crop of fruit trees you don't want to have to pick from. You better stand. I got to stop, Brittany. I got to stop. Maybe you've been in the tent. Can I tell you something? I want you to hear me. I'm, I'm done, I promise. You do not have to settle in the tent. You don't have to settle with Hagar. Move out of the tent. Don't you think it's time for your view to be a view of God about you? Isn't it time for you to realize your worth and to see you how God sees you? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, And the Lord answered and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon your tables, that he may run and readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, not a lie. Though it tarry, listen to it, though the fulfillment of the vision tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. When God gives you a vision, Write it down, make it plain, and wait for it. Wait for it. As we take communion today, I really felt like anytime we have communion, I pray, God, when are we going to have it? How are we going to flow into it? And I really felt like the Lord was telling me, I want you to, what better way to get a clear vision than remembering the price of the cross? What better way to leave the tent than by remembering the bread and the blood? Does everybody have, everybody have communion? If not, we'll get you some. What better way to step outside of the tent than going, it's not in my own strength, it's in the one that died for me. As you move back out of your tent and you come out and you pass through my methods into God's message, let God show you the stars today. As you take this bread and you drink this juice, remember, let God refresh your vision. Let God refresh your vision. If you'll open your bread now, the Bible says, as often as you eat this bread, you do it in remembrance of me until he comes again. Will you break the bread? Remember the vision. If you don't have a vision as you're holding this bread, I want you to say, God, as I eat your body, give me a vision. Take, eat in remembrance of Jesus. Do it now in Jesus' name. Oh. Focus us back on you, Jesus. Focus us back into your flesh that was broken. Your body that was beaten. Your body that hung on a cross. Your body that died but yet rose again glorious and triumphantly. Help us remember God. Take your juice. The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. I'm going to ask you to do something I've never asked you to do. I want you to think about the sins of your life. I want you to get a vision of the blood of Christ covering them. See all your mistakes. See them covered in the blood. As you drink what represents the blood, I want you to see the blood covering all your faults, all your failures, all your mistakes, all your sins, the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We partake of your blood today. We take of this juice we do it in honor and remembrance of the blood that was shed for me. Take drink in Jesus' name. Jesus, I thank you. Can I invite everybody just to worship for just a moment?
Will you step outside of your tent, raise your hands and look up and begin to see the stars? Your vision may look different than mine, but it's unlimited in God. Right now, in remembrance of Jesus, in remembering of the body that was broken, in remembrance of the blood that was spilled, will you please look up? <laughs>